Continue talking, that's fine, eh? no problem with that. Good morning. Good morning. How are all of you? Very good. Um, how many of you were excited when it started raining on Monday? Oh, I'll tell you, wasn't that wonderful? My, my wife left as many windows open as she could to simply sit there and listen to it. Did you ever do that, just listen to the rain falling? Yeah. Nothing more beautiful, I think, in all the world. Two and a half inches in one week. Two and, wow, well, that's wonderful, wonderful. Grass is green. Uh, don't tell me that, I know that. <laughs> My wife said, maybe you better cut the grass, so I started cutting it on, um, what was it? On Thursday, I think it was, after it stopped raining in the morning. And I got finished yesterday. So, yeah, it's, and I don't have that much. I, you know, I'm in town. I don't have that much ground. But, man, grass was pretty thick and kind of nice, and it was lovely. It was lovely. Well, it's good to see all of your smiling faces this morning. You are smiling out there, aren't you? I didn't clean my glasses this morning. You are smiling. Good. Good to hear you. Um, how'd the movie night go? Sparsely attended? Oh, I'm sorry. You forgot it? Eh. Well, you know, maybe there's such a thing as putting together a, you, you've seen these treeless phone trees? Putting together a phone tree and, and spreading the word around uh, the day before, and maybe that would help. I don't know. We'd only be so much help. <laughs> well, it's, it's really good to be here again today. Again, my name is George Wislam, and um, we live in Lanark. Uh, we live right behind the high school um, on Pearl Street. Uh, it's a yellow house. So if you're ever in the parking lot of the high school, just look to the north and there's a yellow house with a yellow, looks like a barn, it's just a garage, and uh, two yellow sheds. Why do we need all these buildings for a small, I don't know. But we, you know, we talked about that yesterday, last week, didn't we? About having so much money that we have to store stuff that we really don't need. And I also told you, I, when I preach, I preach not to somebody else, I preach to myself. You know, because I'm as great a sinner as anybody else. Now, I guess some People feel that pastors ought to be better than that. Um, I think the only difference between a pastor and anybody else is that uh, we've come to realize how poor we really are, you know. And the power of, of any church, any church, is in the pews. You guys are the strength of this church, and you keep it going. How old are you, George? How old am I? You know, my, my wife used to say that she was 18 and had been for several years, and that was until she turned 70. Um, I am 72 today. No, 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 it's not my birthday. Today I'm 72. Later in the week I'll be 73. So I've got one coming up yet. So that's how old I am. Okay. Are there any other questions for me before we go any further? <laughs> how many children do I have? We have one daughter who is uh, 40, she'll be 42 this year. Um, she was born on Christmas Day in 1979. And um, she... Uh, loves dogs. She went to uh, United Methodist School in Ohio, um, which had a wonderful scholarship program for her, and so she took that scholarship. Um, and she graduated in environmental studies um, and a minor in uh, business administration. And so she works for a, she used to work for um, in Shannon, anybody know the kennel in Shannon? Four Paws, she worked for Four Paws, that's where she started. And then from Four Paws, 
she went to Carlson Canine Camp in Freeport. And then from there, she is now working at uh, Brooks Barks and Recreation. And she's a Barks Ranger. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's strange. It's very strange. We've got a very strange family. But we love each other, so that's what matters. Any other questions? One child. One child. One girl. That's it. Yeah. Yeah, we figured out what was happening. We decided that was enough. <laughs> so, well, good. I'm glad you're here. And thank you for asking me questions. I appreciate that. Um, announcements uh, for today. Are there any, any announcements? I didn't hear any scuttlebutt in the back. Um, Richard and Linda are on their way going west. So uh, you're going to have to put up with me singing today. I apologize for that. Um, and uh, it's his birthday today. And he didn't tell me. How old is he? Do you know? 72, 72, 73. 72. 72. 72 today. So, and uh, I didn't realize we've done some business with him before. My wife said, oh, he, is he the guy who has this thing out here? Yeah, he has the greenhouse out here and does all that landscaping stuff. So, yeah. Okay, no announcements. Nothing coming up right away. I think coming up next month. November. Another movie night? Any such thing? Okay, I'm seeing a bunch of quizzling looks looking around at everybody, so I, I, I'm guessing not. Well, thanks for putting up with me again. I promise you, you won't have to put up with me again. Um, but it is good to be with you this morning. And uh, pray that uh, God continues to bless you. I do. I do. Um, I guess if it were me um, and I was putting together worship service, I think we would spend a lot more time just talking to one another and being together as the church. Uh, I don't know that we do enough of that. Um, you, are, you are the church. What's the old thing with the kids, you know? Here is the church, here is the steeple, open the doors, there's all the people. Uh, you guys make it up and you make it work. And you are living proof that it's not the pastor who makes it work. Um, so that's why I think it ought to be shared with one another. Well, if, if not, we do have an order that we need to follow. And so let me invite you, if you would, to turn in the hymnal to number 724. And let me invite you, if you are able, to rise. Lord God, in whom I find life, health, and strength, through whose gifts I am clothed and fed, through whose mercy I have been forgiven and cleansed, be my guide, strength, Savior, and Lord of my life. I offer my prayer through Christ. Amen. And our first hymn is number 544. Oh, mm -hmm. 
with me as we pray together the invocation. Blessed and loving God, we give you thanks for the beauty of this day. We've talked about it all morning. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for hearing our earlier prayer for rain, for the beautiful sound of rain falling to the ground, for the gift of grass growing green in sight of that. We ask, Heavenly Father, that we, like the grass, might grow green with the warmth of your love the light of your spirit, and the fellowship that we share together. Be with us then in this time, Heavenly Father, we ask in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ, through whom we pray. And all the people would say, Amen. You may be seated. And uh, we have a time for sharing and prayers. Are there any prayers that we need to bring up this morning? That's fine. So, anyway, first of all, I just want to thank the Lord that we are able to meet in freedom without any fear of our lives because we are Christians. And to pray for all the persecuted Christians all over the world. Amen. Boy, you see it on TV, boy, they, uh, we, have, we live a good life. We truly do. We truly do. And we talk about it. It sounds so easy to say, but it's um, it's something deep. It really is. Joyce. And for those missionaries that were kidnapped yesterday, they said in Haiti. I had. I heard, heard that on the news last night. Oh my! Okay. Involved. My goodness. Got waylaid. My goodness. Also, I had a joy this weekend. My my grandson flew into his mom's uh, from Colorado, and we we were surprised for us because they were having a little party for me yesterday, and, and his mom's birthday is this week or two weeks. So he flew in, and so it was a big surprise, and we had a nice little party also. So that was great. You know, I was going to ask you. You know, how was the celebration of your birthday? It's been two weeks. And I thought, no, that was a wrong thing to ask you. Now, I should have asked you, see, because it was good. It was added to. Are there others? Uh, through my work this week, I, I learned that there are going to be a large number of Afghan refugees that are going to be relocated in Illinois, and quite a few of them in Rockford. So when you think about the, um, the, the amount of work that's going to be for the people that help them and for them to be housed and acclimated into our society, I, I think we need to be in prayer for that. Definitely. Um, I know this was decades ago. But when I was a, a boy, oh, about your age, I think, um, my, the church I was a part of um, adopted a 
family from Cuba, because that was during the time that uh, Cuba was switching. And um, I know the work that we went through was, was hard, but boy, I can't tell you the rewards, you know, the spiritual rewards that we received from that event. And uh, I don't know if these folks have already been spoken for, but um, if they aren't, and we might want to follow that, um, think about that as an option. These, these are folks who are going to need a place to live and not just stuck with you necessarily, but a part, place to start their lives over again. And you saw how they left, didn't you? They had nothing. And they're coming with nothing except what they have inside. And I think we can learn a lot from each other in that whole process. So thank you for, for reminding us of that. I appreciate that. Are there others? Well, that's great. That's wonderful. Let's uh, bow together for a moment of prayer, shall we? Gracious and loving God, you, you pour upon us so many things. We were talking in the back before about all the ground that we own as a nation, the, from sea to shining sea, um, from one latitude <laughs> to the southern latitude. We own so much ground. And it seems, Heavenly Father, that there is so much that we could do in and for the world, the world for which your son, Jesus Christ, died. He lived with us. He died for us. Father God, as we think about that, we think about those who are bearing the message of Jesus Christ, uh, about those missionaries from Haiti who have been captured and, and, and taken somewhere. And we know nothing about where they are. We don't know who they are exactly. We don't know um, if they are safe or if something has happened to them already. They born the name of your son, Jesus the Christ. And Heavenly Father, that's the kind of thing we're here for. We're, we're here to follow our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. But as we see them taken, we, we pray for them, Heavenly Father, first for their safety, if that's possible. And if it's not that, Heavenly Father, we know your arms have been wrapped around them from the very beginning. We know that they are safe in your care, in your, in your hands. And we know, Father God, that uh, you're not going to let anything happen to them uh, unless you are there. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you'd be with their families as they wait to, to find out what's going to happen. If they can be rescued, Heavenly Father, we pray that that would happen soon for them. Because in that kind of a situation, uh, it is a matter of how soon we can get to them for care and protection. We pray, Heavenly Father, also for um, the Afghans who are coming after they have served our nation so faithfully for the last 20 years. We know, Heavenly Father, that many of them were, were translators and uh, people who took care of, of, well, their whole nation. Many of them, Heavenly Father, were teachers, were helpers, were kind, loving, families who were afraid for their lives and then set free from that fear and then again, Heavenly Father, brought back into that fear. We pray, Heavenly Father, that as these Afghans come to our area, to, into this region of Illinois, that you might bless them here, that they might see a place where they can find hope and settle, working hard as they always have. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you might make their journey just a little bit easier, that we might be instruments of that care. There might, might be ones who might welcome them, giving them a place. Whatever, Heavenly Father, for these we would ask your mercy and your blessing and that you would continue to watch over them. Now, Heavenly Father, we pray for our nation, all of us as a nation. When I la left last week, we were commenting about how we are so fragmented and how much we need to be reunited. 
We pray, Heavenly Father, we might find ways of reuniting, not continuing to separate one another, but, but to love one another as you've taught us to do. Well, Heavenly Father, continue to be with us in this day. Be with us in this time of worship. Strengthen us as we sing. And then bless us, Heavenly Father, for continuation of your word and your ministry. We ask this in the name of your Son and our Savior, Jesus the Christ, who taught us when we pray to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you for that last consideration. Turn back to your hymnal, if you would. We're going to sing number 401, This Little Light of Mine. one is found in your folder. It's number 38 in the folder. <clears throat> Do you all have a folder? Yes, I see folders in the pews. But you probably all know them by heart, right? <laughs> Scripture for this morning comes to us from the Gospel of Mark again. I'm reading from the 10th chapter, starting with the 35th verse and going through the 45th verse. This is the word of the Lord. Then James and John, the son of Zebedee, came to him saying, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. You listen to that? We want you to do whatever we ask. And he said to them, well, what do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, grant to us that we may sit 
one on your right side and the other on your left in your glory. But Jesus said to them, you do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? And he said to him, we are able. Jesus said to them, well, then you indeed will drink the cup that I drink. And with the baptism I am baptized with, you will be baptized. But to sit on my right and the other on my left is not mine to give. But it is for those for whom it has been prepared. And when the ten heard what they began to say, greatly displeased with James and John. Can you imagine? Of course they'd be displeased. Now, the others are trying to get this idea that, hey, these two think they're better than us. So what do they say? But Jesus called the disciples together and said to them, you know that those who are considered rulers over the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be so among you. But whoever desires to become great among you shall be your servant, and whoever of you desires to be first shall be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. May God grant to us a new understanding of his word. Amen. Uh, a very short boy growing up wanted to become a basketball player. In fact, he desired it so much, he came to his dad and he said, Dad, when I grow up, I'm going to play professional basketball. Well, his dad didn't want to, you know, really quelch all of his desires quite that early. So um, dad went to a local coach and asked if there was anything that he could recommend that might help this young boy grow a bit, get a little bit taller. And uh, the coach said, well, you know, you might go down to the museum. They have one of those uh, Middle Ages Torture, is it, you know, torture devices, you know, that stretches you out. And pull, yeah, pulls you out and makes you yeah. stem. You might try that. Well, the father was a little skeptical, but okay. He took the coach's advice. And so they went down there. And a few weeks later, the coach stopped the father and said, well, well did you go through with it? Did, 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 did you put him on the rack? And the father said, well, I did. Well, did it help him any? He said, well, I don't know if it helped him at all, but boy, I learned a lot of things that he did that I didn't know about. Here we are in a time when uh, so many things seem so strange to us. But there comes a time of understanding who we are and what our relationship is to that. We don't like our relationship, but we'd like it to change. A young, guy by, a young guy by the name of Michael was going to college, and his parents decided to drive up and surprise him. I can remember my parents driving up to college to see me and surprise me. I hated it. <laughs> uh, I, I hated it because Usually I had other plans, and they didn't know about it. But nonetheless, they went up to see Michael. And when they got there, they were disgusted because his room was a total mess. They couldn't make hide nor tail out of it. It seemed that he was paying more attention to his hobby, working with electronics, than he was with anything else. And his father said, you know, son, you better straighten up, and you better just decide right now to straighten up because we're not going to pay for this college education for you to go all the way through this. Well, about a year later, the kid decided he took his dad's advice and he quit. Not the hobby, school. And he went off. And he decided to uh, 
take his hobby with him. This is about 1989. He decided to go into business, and his goal was to become bigger than IPM, IBM. IBM at the time was the premier maker of computers. And so Michael Dell started out in 1989 making computers out of a garage. And within 10 years, that company had outstripped IBM in the manufacture, production, and sales of personal computers. How many of you either have now or have had a Dell computer? Raise your hand. A Dell computer. See? All of us have had a benefit, you might say, from somebody taking a, a, a goal, a vision, a dream, and making it come true. But there are some things that you need to understand about those dreams. James and John came to Jesus with a goal. Their goal was to sit, sit at Jesus' right hand or his left hand. Didn't matter which one for them. They weren't particularly picky. Just promise us, promise us that you'll do that. Don't you hate it? Do you ever have a kid come up to you, one of your children come up to you and say, Dad, Mom, give me what I want. Have you ever had that happen? Yeah. You know, we do that to God all the time. Uh, we go to God and we say, God, we want rain. Well, recently it made some sense because we hadn't had any for a long time. But sometimes we say, can we have some rain? But, but don't do it on Saturday or Sunday because, you know, we have a game coming up on Saturday or Sunday and we don't want to play in the mud. Uh, don't, don't do it on Thursday because, you know, the kids are coming home and I'm afraid for them being on the road uh, and I don't want them sliding anywhere. Uh, Lord, Lord, do that for me, but do it my way, the way I want it. Have you ever done that? Look at your prayers real closely. Be sure you know what you're praying, that you're not putting God into some kind of box like the disciples tried to put Jesus in. You know, promise me this, but I won't tell you what it is until after you promise. What kind of a deal is that? Um, James and John were bold. Do whatever we ask, that's fine. But who was in charge? They were the ones they thought who were in charge. But Jesus knew better. We can recognize that uh, he was the Messiah. We can thank James and John that they recognized that. They knew that Jesus was going to be successful. Do you hear that? Do you hear that in the scripture? They knew Jesus was going to be su successful. They knew that he was going to be a king, that he was going to have power and authority, and they just simply wanted to share in that power and that authority. Wouldn't you like that? They certainly were looking forward to it, I mean, we got on board this boat just to be sure that uh, we were going to get our share, Jesus. That's why we're here. And sometimes I think people take their Christian vows that way because they think because of uh, Jesus and their faith and being disciples, somehow or other, they're going to be free from any trouble, any pain, any issues. And quite frankly, if you read the scriptures carefully, realize that that's not what it's about. It's not about being protected from anything. It's not being set free from anything. It's not being given special dispensation from anything. It's being put into a place where you have to give. Give? Us? What do we have to give? Jesus says, you don't know what you're asking. Can you drink from the cup that I have to drink from? Can you be baptized the way I was baptized? I dated a, a girl when I was in, yes, believe it or not, I actually had dates when I was in high school, I actually did. I dated a girl in high school who was a Southern Baptist. And baptism in the Southern Baptist Church is how? 
Anybody know? It's dunking. You know, you get a big pool, and you go underwater, and this girl was afraid of water. I mean, drinking water was an experience by itself, let alone having to be baptized and be dunked. She was scared when she was baptized. She says, I want you to go with me when I go to be baptized. Um, why? Because I don't want to die. Well, I was pretty sure the pastor wasn't going to let her die. But when she came up out of the water, she was sputtering. She was sputtering. You don't know what kind of baptism you're going to have to go through. That was a real test of faith for her to be baptized as a Southern Baptist. You don't know the cup that I have to drink from. You don't know what I have to put up with. Oh, we can do it. Whatever you can do, Jesus, we can do. We're great. Did you really consider the cost when you became a disciple of Jesus Christ? Did you sit down and do the figuring? Did you do the math? Or was it something that was required of you? In the, in the, I was raised a Methodist. Now, in the Methodist church, you grew up and uh, you got to a certain age and you're becoming a member. I don't care what your friends are doing. You're going to become a member here. I don't care. I don't want to hear about it. You're going to do it this way. It wasn't any kind of debate, even an argument. You're going to do it. I don't know. It isn't that way here, is it? You make your own decision. Did you sit down and consider what it's going to cost you? Did you think hard and long, like these missionaries? Did you think long and hard that it might cost you something? Well, it can happen. James and John wanted a high place, and they didn't want to pay for it. They didn't want to have to work for it. They didn't want to have to sacrifice for it. Uh, there's a story, a cute story about a little boy playing t-ball. You know what t-ball is? Everybody here know what t-ball is? Anybody here not know what t-ball is? Okay. Not a problem. I didn't know what it was until I had a kid that was about that age. T-ball is where they take, you know what a tee is for golfing? They put this stick in the ground and you put your ball on top of it. So the ball isn't stuck in the ground when you go to drive the ball out for the first time. Well, that's what it is, except it's not that low. low. It's just oh, about shoulder high for what the child would be. And it holds the baseball. Baseball isn't thrown to them. And when they're told to go ahead and swing, they swing as hard as they can. They try to hit that ball off the tee and see where it goes. And then they have to run the bases just like they would as though they were playing baseball. You are all familiar with baseball, aren't you? Okay. Well, this little kid got up, swung as hard as he could, and ran to third base. And uh, the coach stopped real quick and went over to the boy and whispered in his ear, and he says, son, that was really Really a very nice hit. You hit that ball real hard. That was very good. I know, he says. Um, and you really ran to the base. You, you were probably the fastest boy out here today running for that base. I know. But tell me, why did you run to third base? He said, well, coach, I wanted to go to third base because that was my goal. I wanted to get a triple because that's what my dad told me to do is get a triple. And I wanted to get it the fastest way I could. So rather than running around to all those other bases, I decided to go right there. See, he wasn't troubled by any rules or any regulations or any speculations. He just wanted to get to third base. And that's what the disciples were doing. They knew what they wanted, and they were going to get there the fastest, easiest, and the cheapest way that they possibly could. James and John wanted a shortcut to earn this place in the kingdom. We wanted to know exactly where we were going. They wanted to be sure of the position 
whether they deserved it or not, didn't matter to them. They just wanted to get a jump on the other 10 that were out there. Jesus knew that before the question was even asked. That's why Jesus called the others together. See, it wasn't the fact that they had a goal that was wrong. It wasn't that they had a fabulous goal that was wrong. It was the simple fact that they wanted to get around the right way to do things. In the kingdom of God, we have to follow God's rules, not ours, not the, not the world's rules. We have to follow God's rules. Have any of you ever heard of a BHAG? A BHAG. I see some eyebrows raising. <laughs> Actually, it came out in the 1990s. There's a book written by Collins and Preher. And Collins wrote in it that what every major corporation needs to have is a big BHAG. In other words, a big, audacious, hairy goal. Big, audacious, hairy goal. BHAG. B-H-A-G. BHAG. It can be so big to be seeming almost impossible. Something that's a big BHAG creates enthusiasm amongst people, the company, the organization, those who are around it. And that enthusiasm goes to produce new ideas, new hopes, new dreams. A BHAG. Now, suggestion of a BHAG. Uh, I look through. And I came up a BHAG, B-H-A-G. <laughs> exactly. A big B, H, hairy, A, audacious, G, goal, BHAG. OK? Can everybody hear me OK? I want to make sure, because I know I have a tendency to drop my voice, and that's a bad habit I got 50 years ago, and not gotten over it yet. Okay. Give you an example of a BHAG. Anybody here ever heard of Dwight D. Eisenhower? Okay, okay. You know that uh, he was a main general during World War II, in Europe. Dwight D. Eisenhower, right? OK. Um, Dwight, in the early teens of our country's history, was in an automobile race. And he was racing, I think it was, from San Francisco to Denver. Doesn't seem that far today. But back in those days, all the roads were muddy. A good road was one that had uh, ruts in it. So at least you could, you know, we have controlled steering now. And all you need to do is get into rut, rut, and that's all you need to do, follow that rut. But it wasn't very good if you wanted to get off the road or do anything else. When Dwight D. Eisenhower was fighting in Germany to, towards the end of the war, he ran across something that amazed him. Is called the Autobahn. Anybody ever heard of the Autobahn? It's a road that the Germans produced. Uh, actually, it's not all that terribly long. But it was smooth and even. And it had overpasses that were at least 17 feet high. There's good reason for that. If you wanted to run a tank, over that road, without destroying the road, you put it on a truck. And putting it on, the, on a truck from the ground to the top of the tank was, guess how many feet? You got it, 17 feet. And so they could move equipment back and forth, and that's how the Germans got stuff going. That's also, by the way, how the Romans got things going. Dwight D. Eisenhower thought, you know what this country needs? 
autobots. And so he proposed that what we need to do as a nation is create roads that are smooth, even, and can be 17 feet high in their overpasses. Go ahead and to the uh, I-80, get out of your car, if you dare, and measure the distance from the road to the bottom of the bridge, and it will be at least how many feet? 17. 17. Eisenhower's idea was to make it so people could get back and forth across the country easily, quickly, and you could explore the nation that for most of them they had fought for. Even if they were at home fighting, they could identify as being their country. This is ours. Most of them had never seen it. Most of the soldiers fighting in the Civil War had never known they had a country until after the war was over. And they came home and talked about how they saw their country. Eisenhower remembered that. And so his goal for us was to unite us by putting together roads. It would be like um, putting together I-80, I-88, uh, the toll road coming out of Rockford. All those would be continuations of that road to show you how impressive it was, what a BHAG it was, the state of Ohio got the Ohio Turnpike done in less than 10 months across the entire state of Ohio. They were that excited about it. it took the state of Illinois three years. But most of us who are living here can remember all those roads being, I can remember them being opened. That's how old I am. You asked how old I was. That's how old I am. I can remember them being opened up. And I can remember my dad saying, well, let's go see. And he hopped on one, came through Illinois, and then we went through the Indiana and then into Ohio. We were in Ohio. My, my mother said, George, don't you think we ought to turn around, go home? <laughs> we hadn't taken time off. It was just a Saturday afternoon drive. Wow. It was amazing. Now you got the idea of what a BHAG is, right? That's a BHAG. Now, Christ had no problem with people who were ambitious. He didn't. What are your dreams? What dreams do you have? Did you ever pray, God, about your dreams? Did you ever ask God to fulfill your dreams? Or maybe if you, to fulfill your dreams, how about if God would only give you a dream? Wouldn't it be nice to have a dream to be given to you by God? Jesus has no problem with ambition or with that. But the problem is, what is it about? Is it big enough? Big enough. I thought I could ask for some pretty big things. I thought I could ask for a college education. And then I could ask for a seminary education. And God says, that's not big enough. What else do you want? And I think I said something along the lines, do you think I could preach for the rest of my life? How old did I say I was? 72. Going to be? You didn't know there was going to be a test, did you? <laughs> and still, oh no, let him talk. Yeah. And still, God has allowed me to preach. It wouldn't be marvelous to know that because of you, though, because you became one of Christ's disciples, because you decided to follow in Jesus' dream, to become a disciple, that you could touch human lives, that you could take people and feed them. People who were so hungry, they didn't know where the next meal was coming from, and you could be the one to give them that food, and not just one meal, but to let them know that they could always go back and have more. Did you ever think of what it would be like to know that you gave medication to people who needed medication? Have you ever seen some of these uh, commercials about people who are in Africa? Seen these little kids in Africa 
whose bones are so thin, their arms are so small, and they're starving to death? Do you ever think about maybe Christian discipleship being feeding somebody like that? Or feeding somebody in this country? Believe me, there are people in this country who are just as bad because they just don't have the resources. Wouldn't it be marvelous to know that because of you and your life, you have taught somebody about Jesus Christ and you were able to have them commit to become a part of the Savior's plan? Everybody might be saved. There are people all around us who have goals, big ones and small ones. But are they big enough? I have two stories to tell, and I want to try to decide which one to tell. I'm going to tell the story of Chloe. Chloe was a, a young woman who was uh, someone I knew who lived in uh, Rockford. And she, um, she had a degree, but she felt God was calling her to get another one. And believe me, her husband was looking at her cross-eyed, going, another degree? Really? We need to spend more money on you getting an education? She wanted a counseling degree. She didn't know where God was taking her. But Chloe decided that she was going to follow that direction. One day, Chloe ran into an old friend from the neighborhood that she grew up with in uh, Florida. That neighborhood was, she was an old high school friend. She was talented, she was ambitious, but she was prematurely gray. She was addicted to drugs, and she was living in a decaying neighborhood in South Florida. And everybody in the neighborhood was just about like that. Finally, Chloe was convinced that God had convinced her to go to get this extra degree because she was going to be needed back home where she grew up from. And so she and her husband picked up, moved back, and started working. Before long, the old neighborhood was beginning to show some signs of prosperity. People were starting to look for jobs. Companies were beginning to feel, realize that there was a potential for workers out of that area. And so they moved into that area. There were people who were finding hope. Jobs were now becoming possible. They may have had less money at one time, but now that community was growing. It was growing because these people were responding to God's love and God's care through Chloe, this young woman. As soon as Chloe was back, her friend said, it was as though God's light suddenly opened up, and for the first time we could see that our prayers were being answered. Not in you, Chloe, but through the mercy of Jesus Christ that touched our lives. Now, wouldn't you like to experience God's blessings that way? Wouldn't you love to be able to touch somebody's life and through touching them, not just them, but everybody else in that community that you knew, suddenly we we're getting better, getting healthier, getting stronger. That's what it's about. That's what it's about. So God's blessings are firsthand. Maybe the problem for us is that our dreams are too small. We quit with them. We don't hold on to them. We let them go far too easy. Whereas God is still trying to talk to us in the time that we've changed and thought God didn't have a purpose for us. Now, God has an audacious plan for all of us, a big, hairy, most audacious goal. That we can live our lives to serve him. And you don't have to be a pastor to do it. In fact, you're better off if you don't. Because what you're doing is a way of serving God, just as you are. Jesus asked James and John, can you drink the cup that I drink and be baptized with the baptism that I've been baptized with? One tradition maintains that James was executed for his faith. He's imprisoned for a while, 
And while he was imprisoned, he talked about his faith and his love of Jesus Christ. And Roman guard would listen in, always on the side, never participating, but just listening in. As James was led out to be executed, to be beheaded, his guard turned to him and said, I believe in Jesus too. I accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior in front of you. James turned to the man, said, Brother, I love you in Christ. Gave him a kiss on his cheek, and the both were beheaded the same day. Now, do you think James understood at the time that he went to ask God, uh, ask Jesus for that blessing, for the gift that they were asking? Do you think he understood what he was going to have to do? Probably not. But in fact, what he did realize later was that the price was not too high. The price was exactly what it needed to be for what he asked. Are you willing to die for Jesus Christ? Are you willing to serve Jesus Christ? More importantly, are you willing to live to serve in the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. If so, say amen. amen. Thank you. Now to close, oh, I love this one. And it almost, it almost fits exactly. Wendy, did you choose this one for my sermon? No, Troy does. Troy does. Oh, my goodness. Troy, thank you. Now, I want you to turn in your hymnal to number 611, soon and very soon. Stand as we sing, will you? You know, there's, that's, we used to put something in hymnals. I don't know if you remember. We used to have amens in hymnals. Did anybody remember when we used to have amens? In the, you know what amen means? Let it be so. Exactly right. Let it be so. You know what another way of saying let it be so is? Somehow or other, we got the idea that in church it was improper to clap. Do you, is it against your church world to, to clap? So I don't want to break it. It isn't? Okay. I think that sometime 
you might want to applaud when you think something is right, when you want to affirm it. I noticed when this young man walks down with a stick going out, I noticed every week I've been here, people have turned to him and applauded. That's the same thing. Very good. Thank you. You did a good job. Would you bow with me for a moment of prayer? Blessed Lord, we thank you for this day, for this time, for this fellowship, for the love that you have for us and the way that you show that love for us. Ask, Heavenly Father, that you would bless this congregation, not only today, but always, in every way and in every place, that as they go from here, they are still being the church, and every action that they have is church action. Heavenly Father, I pray that every church action that comes from this congregation will bring honor and glory to your name. Now use us, Heavenly Father, as we go. Bless those for whom we have prayed, and use us as your disciples. We ask this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. And again, all the people would say, talk too long. <laughs> Go in peace and may the peace of Jesus Christ always be with you. Amen.